All right, welcome to the June 29th weekly Jupiter Lab call. Today we have 18 people on the call and hopefully more are coming. Um, please find the link to today's meeting minutes in the chat. If you just joined, let me just paste that in one more time. And uh, if you feel inclined, please add your name to the attendees list. And if there's something you'd like to discuss, please create a bullet point in the agenda section. Or if you think it'll take more than a few minutes, please add it in the additional discussion section, which we'll get to at the end of the call. And I will stop recording sometime before the call ends in case there are announcements you want to make that you don't want to post on YouTube. So with that out of the way, why don't we get started? Today's first agenda item is from Nicola. Yeah. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, we just wanted to make a quick announcement for the because we put MB Grader uh, on Jupyter Lab. So for those who don't know MB Grader, the main features are to be able to create assignment and to share uh, assignment between a teacher and student and uh, then to grade it and, uh, and hear some feedback. Um, there were already several attempts to, to port it to JupyterLab. So we used uh, one of them from the NGFR project and we finalized uh, the lab extension and the packaging. Uh, so it seems that I cannot uh, share my screen. Uh, it's a known issue uh, from uh, from Zoom, so I cannot show you, but uh, it's composed of, uh, of four server extension and five uh, lab extension. Um, and uh, that's almost it. So it's, uh, it works now uh, with Jupyter Lab under four. And uh, the next step will be to port it to Jupyter Lab four and then uh, do So that's it for the quick announcement. Um. Do you want to do a screen share? Sorry? Do you want to do a screen share? A demo? I can't. I can't. It seems that uh, because I'm Ubuntu uh, 22, it seems that uh, Zoom doesn't okay. have a screen share. It's a non issue. Maybe, um, maybe in the next next week's call, you could or something, because that sounds awesome. And I think people would love yeah, to see it. Maybe if I find a way uh, in the day, I, I let you know. Cool. Uh, I, I give you a hint to do that and you should be able to, to do it later in the call. Okay. Cool, thank you. This is really good news. And it is one of the things we talked about in the Notebook 7 PEP as being a prerequisite for this. So I'm really uh, excited to see this working. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chung, you are up next. Uh, yes, hello everyone. I'm uh, Chung Le from Constack, and uh, today I will present my ongoing work about integrating the language server protocol extension into uh, Jupyter Lab. Uh, sec, I will share my screen. You can see my screen. Yep. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I put the link to the pull request in uh, the is the Markdown document, and uh, basically for now the language server pro protocol support for Jupyter Lab is provided by the Jupyter Lab LSP extension. Uh, it's a REST grab extension with a lot of feature, but uh, it is not easy for Jupyter Lab Core or some uh, external extension to profit from the LSP server. So what I'm trying to do in this pull request is to pick some component of the extension and integrate it into the, the core of Jupyter Lab so that some internal package or some uh, other extension it can use a uh, language server protocol feature. And uh, I will uh, first do a demo of uh, what uh, does it look like. Uh, so for now, for on the front end, 
uh, in the running panel, I add a new uh, language server section, uh, which means showing the running language server with JupyterLab. And if I open a Python notebook, JupyterLab will detect the language of the notebook and start the associated language server. And uh, the second thing in the setting page, we have a new entry for the language server, which will show the list of installed language server, uh, which is supported uh, by JupyterLab. Uh, so for example, here I installed two language server for Python language. Uh, and so I can choose the priority of the server. The server with higher priority will be used with the um, notebook or with the uh, uh, Python file. And uh, uh, here is uh, in, the, in the current pull request, I only integrate the core element of the Jupyter FSP extension. Uh, uh, this means the, the part which handles the server initialization and the communication between the front end and the back end, like so in this diagram. So on the front end feature of the language server is not yet integrated, but it will be the subject of future work. Uh, but for the demo, I, I, I created a, um, a, attention, a new attention for JupyterLab, which will use the, the new LSP API of JupyterLab to, to, to add a complete provider to JupyterLab. For example, here uh, in the setting, uh, in the code completion uh, section, uh, normally we have a complete provider from the context and the content. And I add a new provider for the language server uh, from my extension. And I deactivate the two default provider. And when I go back to my notebook, uh, the complete item here, it comes from the result of the running Python language server. And uh, because you see a, the result come from the language server, it also work with a normal Python file. Uh, so if I'm on the normal Python file without the kernel, this thing can get the complete result for, for my document. And if we look at the, the source of the, my extension, it requires sample. Uh, I only need to request the, the LSP connection manager and the LSP feature manager from JupyterLab. And then I will create the complete provider uh, for the language server protocol. And even the provider, it is only about 200 lines of code uh, because I don't need to deal with uh, setting up or connecting to the language server. Everything is provided by JupyterLab. I only need to get the result from the language server and transform it into the format of the computer of JupyterLab uh, to make it work. And uh, this is uh, the front end part because the uh, extension, the container sees the server extension part to handle the lang language server. And we already discussed with the team of uh, Jupyter server, and we decided to move the, the server part, the server extension of the Jupyter Lab MSP extension into a standalone repo inside the Jupyter server organization. And uh, this to request is only related to the front end part and on the technical part, uh, basically uh, are done. And if someone have a time to take a look at it, uh, it would be great. And that's it for me. Sweet. Thank you for the demo. Any questions, comments? Any uh, volunteers to review? Uh, Vidal has a hand raised. Yeah. Oh, cool. Go for it. I just had a question. So the, um, the as far as I understand, the plan was to depend on the the server side package in Jupyter Lab, but um, does that include any specific language server implementations? Like I see, the default now is PyLS. Yeah, is that? Is that included by default, or is that something you would inst install extra separately? Uh, uh, no, the language server doesn't come with uh, JupyterLab. It's so only which we, we detect automatically if you have a, some language server installed on your environment. If not, right. it will not show anything. 
Okay, yeah, good. I, I think I agree with that choice because uh, some of these language servers are not, um, you know, as uh, open source and as open governance, maybe as, uh, <laughs> as you would always want. Um, Mike has a question in the chat about a, a PR in the JupyterLab LSP org and whether it can be included in the work that you've done, Trung. Uh, ah, sorry, I didn't see it. I think, uh, at first I think it's uh, related only to the server path, but it contains also the, the front end path. Ah, I see. So my understanding of the PR is that this is about UI components, which are not included in, in Chung's PR. Yes, so, because they are they are just being added. So I, I am thinking whether that is something which would be nice to discuss up front when integrating, um, whether we would have this uh, user interface for configuration as an vision idea the PR. Uh, for the current uh, PR, we have a much more simple uh, setting UI for the language server, but I think it uh, we can uh, integrate it later on another step for the setting UI because there are some different things between the the code in the core Jupyter Lab and the language server uh, on Android extension, and I think we still need have a summary work on the the current PR to to make it work with the uh, inside Jupyter Lab. Oh. Just wow. for, I don't know if any people realized, realize that this is a really big deal. Uh, so, I mean, uh, this is a big feature that was initially in Nick's and Michelle's extension. And there has been a lot of work put into this massive pull request that's been rebased quite a few times already. And one of the main sort of milestones for JupyterLab 4. So um, we're really excited about this. I think um, this sort of functionality being not just inside notebooks, but inside other files is going to make JupyterLab a more compelling place to stay. If you only went for it for some tasks and had to leave for other tasks, it might keep users on and that's really cool. And uh, it's also just awesome to bring it into core. So thank you for all the work. Yeah, I have to say, I, I think we had, I don't, I don't remember if the name Microsoft already had the name LSP at the time, but I think I remember the very first conversations about this at Microsoft in 20, I don't know, 2016, maybe 2015. I mean, a long time ago. I think in, in one of the visits where I met with Craig uh, and, and others from the, from the Google team, I remember conversation with Microsoft about these ideas and kind of how much sense it made given the vision that we had for JupyterLab from the from, from inception, right? How much sense it made to have this, this kind of model in it. And at the time, I, I think Microsoft already had called it that, or at least they were beginning to work on some of those ideas and kind of thinking about making that kind of a, a standalone component and seeing this finally land is, is pretty awesome. And I've been I've been working exactly with the model that you described, Darian, lately. In in I just yesterday gave a talk at Berkeley is holding a national data science education workshop, and my talk yesterday was precisely about how to use JupyterLab to teach kind of end-to-end -end computing to students who are doing research and learning, and how to do pretty much all of their computational life uh, in the cloud with version control reproducibly and. The whole story of Jupyter Lab is kind of a linchpin of that story. Of that, it's not just the notebooks. It's it's and that was the the, the exact point of the talk. So to, for me, this is pretty critical, and and I'm delighted. And thanks so much, Nicola, for uh, and and uh, and uh, Tong for doing this work, uh, and Trong, I'm sorry uh, for doing this work because both the MB grader and and this work are really critical to at least kind of the story we're building with. Education and research. 
Oh, awesome. By the way, Nicola seems to be ready for a screen share. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, to work now. Uh, uh, do you have it? Yep. Yep. Okay. So uh, I will just present you uh, quickly the, the extension, but you have one uh, there on the right panel here, uh, which work on the um, on the same metadata. So you can change uh, the metadata on the cell, and uh, and that will uh, create specific assignment uh, from that metadata, those metadata. And uh, there is one extension to validate the the notebook. So it executed. So the notebook is executed on, uh, on the server side, and uh, if there is no no cell with error. Uh, it gives you a success result if I uh, don't seem stupid. Should raise an error. Uh, and then the two other um, uh, extension are for uh, to share to share the uh, the assignment between student and the teacher. Uh, so that one is for teacher side. Uh, you can create your assignment. You can uh, you can generate the student side assignment. Uh, then you can release it and uh, and collect uh, when the student has uh, filled the notebook. Uh, that one is for the stu student side. So. Uh, you can fetch some assignment if there are some. Uh, then you can work on it if you have to fill uh, to fill the notebook. You can try to validate it. Uh, so this one, yeah, you should raise. Okay, and you can submit your assignment. And as soon as you, you submit the assignment, the teacher can collect it and uh, and work on it to. Uh, to, to grade it. So if you go there, you can do auto grade and uh, generate feedback. So I will not show you all the features, but uh, but it's now working on the Jupyter Lab. Sorry if I missed this, uh, Nicolas. Could you clarify? Does this need lab four or does it run on lab three? I, I, I missed it if you said that already. I can't hear you, Nicola. I think you're muted. Nicola, could you hear the question from Fernando? Yeah, sorry. My computer. <laughs> I have some trouble with Ubuntu. Okay, I can hear now. Uh, I was just asking does this run on Jupyter Lab? Three or does it need Jupyter Lab four? I, and sorry if you said that already. Yeah, it's Jupyter Lab three. Cool. Thank and you. we are working on the. So this, this will be the next step to port it to Jupyter Lab four and uh, to Notebook seven. Awesome. Thank you very much. There is a pre release that was done today of this. So if yeah, you want to try, you can try it from the pre release. So you have to wait for the second pre-release because the first one is not working. And uh, so we, had, we, we will do the second uh, today or tomorrow. I'm waiting for the permission from uh, from Jessica to do it. Oh, I can do it. I can add you. OK. okay. OK, cool. Um, Frederic, you are up. And welcome back. Thanks, Ashin. Hello, everybody. Uh, so not much on my side. The first point is just I've seen things and didn't look much in detail what's the reason for it. So in two PRs that are updating dependency, uh, we start to hit uh, YGS multiple import error. As 
I'm lucky Kevin is there and maybe uh, I, I assume it's because it's trying, we are trying to import twice YGS, like maybe two different versions. That could be the reason. Yeah, it's either two different versions, although I don't think that's the case. I think uh, what is happening is that you import both the um, common JS version, uh, which is the thing that Node.js usually uses, and the uh, ECMAScript version, which is like the new module type definition that is often used by Webpack. And this error basically occurs if you use two different versions, and these are different, uh, different scripts, basically. These are different bundles. And this can lead to serious issues. So um, please try to fix this. Other, otherwise, you might get issues. Although, if it's just examples, um, maybe you don't care too much. Uh, I'm not sure how this is caused. Yeah, that's for now. It's only in the federated examples. But yeah, I, I I'm unsure. Like uh, I, I would rather fix it. Mm. And uh, a side a side question is: Should we enforce resolution of a fixed version like React? Like for React, you are forcing like six, seventeen or the top package level. And should we do something like that for YGS, as it's like no an official big dependency, mm -hmm. or do don't you do you think it's not needed? Um, I think what you should do is just use Semver to use the latest version of version 13, uh, and in, in next month or something version 14. But use always the latest version. Try to do that. Um, something that I can recommend, maybe also for the other approach, is to you uh, to specify in Webpack or whatever bundle you're using. I think that's Webpack that you want to resolve to that specific file in in YJS, so you don't resolve to the ECMAScript version, you always resolve to the to the common JS version or always the ECMAScript version. Uh, you can specify that. And I think we already did something like this. Maybe it is not yet there in examples. Maybe. Um, yeah, yeah that, you're right. It may be only something missing in the example. I, I will yeah. do that. Thanks a lot for the input. Sure thing. Uh, and the other one, so uh, at Quantstack, we have uh, a client that's paying us for looking at a memory leak. Uh, so I start to uh, push some fixes. Uh, the, the, that's the link to the PR. Uh, maybe I will just try to be brief and share my screen. Um, it's mainly a design question. Uh, oops, already I get another tab. Um, so we get a specific menu that is called a ranked menu in JupyterLab. Here. And uh, this guy is returning uh, a disposable menu item. In, so when you are creating an item, we wrap that item in another object that has a dispose uh, method, let's say. And the trouble with that is that within this disposable, we are connecting the menu to listen. If the menu is disposed, we are dealing, deleting that thing. And what could happen, and that's why the PR for memory is introducing this weak reference, is that the item can actually be deleted without uh, the disposable menu being deleted. So an example for that is that if the, if the user asks directly on the menu, please clear all items, the items will be uh, removed, from, won't be linked in the menu because the array will be uh, reset. Uh, but the disposable menu, we still hang, be hanging because we have this signal connected. And uh, so this weak reference, it allows to free the memory for the items, but that disposable menu is still hanging in the, in the memory. So if somebody uh, has better ID how to refactor that code or a better API pattern, because those are not really public, I think. Oh yeah, they, they are public, but maybe if somebody has some ideas how to, to do similar things without that, that strange uh, wrapping of an item within a disposable um, menu item, we'd be glad to, to improve the, that part of the code. And that's all for me. All right. Um... Uh, is it my turn or Darian, do you want to say something first? No, no, I was just going to say you are. All right. Uh, sounds good. Uh, yeah, thanks, Frederick. Um, so um, I joined this meeting because I created a PR. Um, first, I want to motivate 
some of the things from uh, that we did last year. Um, last year, we, uh, we basically came up with this shared model approach that basically, um, and that was like a group effort, right? Um, um, Eric was also, Eric Charles was also very uh, involved in this. And um, I, I really like this approach, the shared model approach, which is basically we uh, find a central place where we define how we want to model uh, Jupyter Notebook, for example, or file in, Node, uh, in, in Jupyter, how we want to model that in YJS, expose these as abstract classes that are really easy to use and modify and listen to. Uh, they have like a really nice API. And we expose that basically um, to the rest of the packages so they can use it to render content or you know, to enrich what they currently have. Um, that was our approach. And from my perspective, uh, I like this approach a lot because it allows us to share this package with other people that maybe want to implement a JupyterLab alternative or that is actually compatible with JupyterLab. So based on the shared model approach, you can easily build uh, your own custom Jupyter notebook using a different editor or whatever it is. Uh, you don't have to use all these components. You, you can do it just the way you want it to. And um, I, I feel like that is that was a really nice approach. And I've actually been thinking of doing this for more things, for example, like calendar data and editor content in the YJS project. Um, so that was, that was our intention. And uh, uh, then basically I've been absent for quite a while um, and uh, Carlos opened a PR that basically removes the shared model approach and reverts back to the model DB approach that we had previously. Um, and there are some reasons to do that. Uh, like, and you should listen to the discussions. Uh, I want to be fair here, but um, I was a bit uh, like, I feel this is not the approach that we should go. Um, I would like to retain, but like that would be uh, my favorite. And I want to convince you of that to retain the shared model approach. Um, that is very reliable. Again, like the other approach that we introduce this model to be is a complete break with what we currently have. Whereas in my PR, I simply remove model DB and simplify the code base. Overall, I remove something like 1,400 lines of code. And I feel everything is a lot simpler now. So I offer this to you. Um, there is a lot of useful information there uh, that should be reused. And you, we know we should definitely discuss um, why, for example, the double binding logic is now much simpler or how we solve the initialization problem because now we don't have model DB anymore. We can make the shared models a single source of truth. And I think for the project that is very important because otherwise you run into, for example, overwriting of content because there are two sources of truth and one of them like model DB or whatever else you have can always override the, uh, the existing content that you have. And this might be a reason why in the current RTC version, um, there are uh, sometimes, there is sometimes data loss. So our, our approach was always, we want to make uh, YGS a single source of truth or shared models and um, initialize the content only on the backend. And this is now completely implemented in this PR, but also in Carlos PR, to be honest, um, so, uh, as a side quest, and, uh, this is something that some of you should look at. Um, I wanted to make the notebook tests run more efficiently and reliably, uh, because they always break for me for random reasons and now they run reliably. So please check it out. Um, even if you're not interested in the other things, uh, but I would very much welcome a P, uh, a review of the PR that I created. Uh, I will send it in the chat again. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. Okay, any questions, comments? So just to give some context before, and if you're still thinking about it, um, we have a, uh, an RTC call that happens every other week. And uh, sometimes they are more lively than other times. Um, these two PRs are the subject of much conversation in those calls and also some discussion and comment threads. And um, yeah, so if this is all new to you, cool. Um, curious what your thoughts are. And if this is not new to you, also cool. Curious what your thoughts are.
I see some comments from Sylvan on the PR itself. And I don't know if maybe we can get a bit of just context and discussion between both Sylvan and Kevin while everyone's listening. It, it, it may help. It's, it's a pretty dense thicket to wade through. And I'm, I'm trying, I am trying to read through, but I'm not using those APIs myself. So if, if there's a bit of discussion uh, about Sylvan's comments, that might help. Oh yeah, this is more of a review comment on this approach, but it could totally be fixed. Uh, so I was looking at it earlier and as I didn't know that Kevin was going to bring it up today, I just checked that it still applied to the latest commits. Um, so, um, so here's my take on it before I get into why I prefer one approach over the other. Uh, so in both pull requests, uh, we remove, so in, in the Jupyter3.x, we had um, we had to retain the model DB uh, data store for uh, state of documents for backwards compatibility reasons. And the way we achieved that was by introducing YGS and the shared models that uh, uh, Kevin uh, wants to push forward uh, as a separate package and do bidirectional, you know, synchronization between the two. One of the goals for JupyterLab 4 was to remove that duplication of data between ModelDB and YGS, right? And um, uh, both Cardos's and Kevin's pull request achieved that, but in a very different way. Although in both cases, in the end, YGS becomes the only source of truth for document state. The wire protocol to communicate with the backend is the same. And the actual quote unquote schema of the documents as YGS documents are the same. Um, now, um, in the case of uh, Carlos, Carlos actually completely removed the shared models uh, that were introduced in 3.x and uses a model DB like object, which are essentially you no know, model DB we had observable lists and observable um, dicks and whatnot, right? Uh, Carlos uh, makes some kind of equivalent to that that is based in YJS, has a slightly simpler even system than model DB had, but it's essentially that, right? Um, another thing that Carlos does, which is somewhat orthogonal to this debate, is that he makes other design choices for the modeling of metadata. Uh, Kevin uh, wants to retain the shared documents and removes model DB completely, making the shared documents the only source of truth for shared state. So in the end, in the case of Kevin, you have different classes or different models for application state that is not synchronized and shared content. So uh, this is really where it's uh, different, uh, I would say. Uh, another aspect of Kevin's approach is that uh, these shared models uh, and this entire hierarchy of classes live in a separate uh, NPM package in the JupyterLab repo instead of being spread across the different implementation classes for sales, output areas, and whatnot. So I think this part was of what I said was a fairly like, purely factual um, like, sort of statement of what these two things did, did right? Um, there has been other discussions that on these two PRs that also touch other aspects of uh, real-time collaboration regarding the modeling of metadata. So as it turns out in Jupyter 3 and earlier versions, there are some metadata attributes that have to be synced because the notebook format is not well specified. And so syncing different parts of, of the same dictionary is actually rather problematic for doing RTC. Uh, and you could make two very valid changes to uh, such a dict and have the auto solver, like auto merger, like result in something invalid. So the way uh, Kevin approached that issue was that he uh, only allowed for metadata to be set and fetched globally. 
Uh, however, we have a, an issue, which is that many extensions actually relied on granular metadata uh, observability, like the grid stack extension and whatnot. So what Carlos did in his PR that could also be done in Kevin, with Kevin's approach was to uh, granularly expose the metadata and simply resolve this issue of synced attribute by just electing one as being the only one that should be used and you know, sort of deprecating the other one. And it's, it's a choice, uh, it's another debate, but uh, that thing could be done in either approach. And it comes with a, another thing is that one constraint that we have that we was sort of decided early on was that uh, the YJS core type should not be exposed too much uh, across the entire JPEG code base. And that choice prescribed making this wrapper on top of YJS that are, uh, you know, the shot types of Carlos, right? Which are quite a bit of, you know, boilerplate code, basically. Um, so yeah, these are the two main things, right? So um, in terms of who agrees with what and which approach, I would say that Eric and Kevin are pretty convinced of the, the shell types, of the you know, shell models. And um, I would say that um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much in favor of uh, Carlos' approach. Uh, I wouldn't want to speak for anyone else on the, on the call, but uh, I think others uh, who work with me um, sort of agree with that. So, um, my sense is that um, this split of uh, application state with shared state is uh, causes kind of double hierarchies of like duplicated hierarchies of classes that are really hard to maintain, especially as they live in two different places um, and in different NPM packages. Uh, what I think is that they really the, the the main argument for that split is that the shared documents that Kevin likes and wants to promote really serve as schemas. And, and that, that's the role that he wants to publish them separately and have them be referenced in the schemas or like, or, you know, shared models for other implementations and whatnot. And uh, what I think about it is that we should really have some kind of schema specification for this rather than like a reference implementation that everybody should do. Um, and in my comments in the pull request, I show that uh, in the example, like in the current state of uh, Kevin's pull request that you just opened, there is already some uh, schema breaking that happens because of this uh, mismatch between the two hierarchies of classes. And um, so, for example, and, and so, and I don't, I think they are totally fixable, and it's not really. Uh, like in themselves, an argument against one that they, they, he could fix them in this PR and they, that my statement would become wrong. Uh, but what I mean is that it illustrates that point that it's hard to keep them missing. So in the uh, specific examples of schema breaking things that happen here is that the code editor, for example, uses a y, the same Y model as the code cell and therefore has uh, things such as execution count um, outputs that are empty, but uh, still there. Um, the base Y model has a source attribute that is not a valid attribute in a notebook. And we are in a read from it in the notebook, like things like this, which make, you know, like would show that you know, the, having two different like sort of parallel implementation of the same thing is error prone in my opinion. Um, so, and uh, so Kevin also had, I think, some arguments about Carlos's approach in how um, he does the, what he calls the double bindings, so between views and models. Uh, and uh, thinks I think he thinks he like that he has a better pattern, although I can't speak of that too much because I don't really uh, not sure I quite understand in which way. The double bindings are better in Kevin's approach, but I'll let him speak and give his arguments. I hope that's so, clear. I think it's appropriate for Kevin to respond, but let me just remind everyone we have 14 minutes left on this call. And uh, I'm happy to forego the agenda item I was going to talk about. Just click the link because there's a discussion I invite you to participate in. And uh, I would like to give Vidar a chance to talk about his. So how about 
we got basically nine more minutes and we'll leave the last five minutes for Vidar. Okay, Kevin, up to you. There okay, you go. How, how much time do I have? Nine minutes for the whole okay. conversation, oh. not just yeah. okay, oh, enough. eight minutes now. Sorry, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. I, I, uh, um, how about we, we make it just our arguments and then, then we can, you know, go yeah. like, debate everything. <laughs> I, I wanted to say, right, um, these, uh, the first things that uh, Savar said um, was was true, like um, the, the state of things, right, uh, regarding his arguments, uh, I, I, I would um, account, like, I would, uh, I would have arguments against that, for example, when he said that, um, that there are problems with the schema, or like, for example, with um, the duplicate hierarchy, um, I, I think the code base as it is in the PR is actually much simpler. Uh, Carlos PR adds something like 7,000 lines of code. Uh, there's a lot of documentation there, but it is some code that is added. And, you know, um, the PR that I have strictly just removes code basically and, you know, changes some lines. But, you know, it's um, from, a, from a review perspective also easier. Um, you know, um, it, it, in, in practice, it really makes sense to separate application state from shared state. Uh, that is what I recommend to a lot of clients. And uh, I think there are a lot of fans and there are already users from uh, from the shared models package. Um, somebody has turned off their, on my, their micro. Uh, Fernando, can you please turn off your mic? Thanks. Um, but uh, maybe that is it. Um, I think in a separate discussion, and I please uh, I very much invite you to come to one of the RTC meetings because we um, uh, we should really discuss this as a community. There are really this is really a big change, and um, I, I would like very much to convince you of the shared models approach of something that I think I believe is very simple, very re reusable outside of this project, and it would be great um, if we if we can talk about this a bit more. That's it. Uh, you have even much more time now, uh, unless there are questions. Um. I think there's probably a lot of questions, but I, I, I do Thanks. think that um, it's better to not get mired in one question because that's what's about to happen probably. Uh, so well, I think one last parting thought I'll, I'll, I'll leave this discussion with is we haven't had this situation before where we have two working good faith implementations that are competing with each other. And we haven't faced that sort of decision point before as a project. Um, it, we do have now new governance that puts us in a position where if we cannot come to a consensus, we can still make a decision by calling a vote, but that seems best left for a last resort, right? So Brian opened two votes that were more about constraining the question, but as Kevin's pointed out in both of those issues, whatever way we decide those things, actually the both implementations could achieve those things. So it doesn't, it's not particularly dispositive, although we would indicate a preference for doing, uh, for, for not shipping shared models with models that contain counterparts and other packages. But beyond that, um, I don't know, we should give some thought to how we resolve a question like this because it hasn't really come up before. And um, how about this? How about Vidar, you do your agenda item and then whatever is left, we will continue this conversation. Is that okay? Cool. All right, yeah. This is feels like being the last talker before for dinner or whatever. But it's uh yeah, I just uh wanted to mention some pull requests I did uh that uh I wanted some input on. I did some pull requests on uh, improving the performance around the this the kernel source view in the debugger. Especially if you have a lot of imports or some of them are rather large, it's uh it could be quite uh, debilitating. But one of the things I wanted to ask, or do we have like a, cus, uh, a standardized component or a component we use for virtualized lists? Because if you have like, I don't know, a few thousand modules imported or, or whatever, a few hundreds, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, these are same size items. It's a perfect uh, use for uh, 
registration one yet. Fred Access, you have one PR. So it, what you're saying is it's not it's not in yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's so you, it's a library that you found that you think is good to use. No, 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 no. Uh, created, it a, created a widget, yeah. Okay. Other than that, uh, uh, William uh, in Cococ is using React Virtuoso. That's pretty awesome. As far as he, he explained, <laughs> I, I looked at it. I haven't used much of it. And otherwise, there is the for React, there is the famous uh, React window. I think stuff. That's but Virtuoso seems more powerful. Yeah. Okay. So there's, um, yeah. there, there's opinions. Okay, so yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's that's not a, that's about starting another discussion since we just skipped one. <laughs> but the, but there okay, is at no least they got official, some input. Yeah, there is no official one. And yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So that the, the, I guess that's the problem. Is I knew that there exists a lot of solutions and people have opinions. I wondered with if you already made a decision. It seems like uh, the, the discussion is still uh, yeah, up in the air. So I'll. Uh, mm -hmm. So that that is a future extension, future improvement in that pull request. So if you already had it, I thought I would implement it, but. Uh, no, I'll just sidestep that and punt. Um, and yeah, so, so quick to get some use on that. Also, I did, um, I see, is Steve still here? Yeah, I did um, a fix for the selection between a, the yarn. So the yarn lock, at least in the three, four branch, is mostly yarnpackage.com. Then the luminal packages was npmjs.org, which our current, a way of replacing the repository with something else relies on all of them being the same and all of them being the value that is hard coded in this commands.py file. But I see that for 4.x, those support requests it switched everything from, from Yarn to NPM. So I was just wondering whether that was uh, on purpose or not, because I think I remember a discussion about or, or seeing like the Yarn repo not responding always or timing out or having some issues. So I just wonder whether that was on purpose. If so, we should do a, a full clean switch. Uh, as, as I understand it, Yarn package is, is basically a proxy now to NPM. Um, and it, 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 if we were to switch to Yarn Berry, they, they do like just a prefix in the Yarn lock file. Uh, but there's reasons we can't switch um, max made a value and effort at one point, but there, there's a lot of <laughs> friction there um so i would say yeah just go ahead and make it work with change it to work with what we have in commands up high is fine or, or just leave the yarn to lock and update commands up high because they this should be interchangeable yeah so I, I made some points on that pull request about possible things to do so currently i'm just reverting it all to yarn package uh but yeah it's um if the npm js is is more performant, uh, or if there were some issues with the yarn package repository, we, we should switch. Um, but then, if 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 there isn't, then we can at least revert to yarn package for now, and then uh, make a cleaner effort in the future. Because now there will be an integrity check. So if somebody tries to switch to npm js, it will it will complain at you a bit. Uh, I also had another question there, but it's better to answer those in the pull requests, I think. So yeah, unless there was any comments there, that, that's it for me. I think I like what you have done, Vidar, to uh, to just keep the the yarn repository as it's a, uh, and maybe we could switch for the could answer that question for four O and maybe switch to npm for decide for four O if we switch it for or not, but presumably, like for for your case for organization having to change the the repository probably better to just keep things like that because maybe they use their own tweak for changing the, the, the log file and not what we are providing. So probably better to keep keep it the way it was. <laughs> Thanks for the PR. Cool. Um, I just noticed on the agenda that I wasn't the only other person. Isabella also notes that the accessibility call is in 19 minutes. Um, and I will forego my issue, which please check out that link. It's about workspaces. I presented five different improvements. Maybe we should do all of them. Maybe we should do none of them. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. 
And uh, I also said I would stop the recording in case somebody wants to say something at the end, like an announcement or something. So I will stop the recording now.